one page in the box we dedicate to all the aquatic life cycles, what's happening under the surface of the water. And we lay out each row almost like a sentence in a book. So on the left side of the row, we have the very earliest life cycle of that bug, fresh from the egg. We put that on the left side of the row. And as we move across each row, then we follow that bug as it grows, as it matures, and then ultimately as it swims towards the surface of the water. So our mergers. That was Peter Stitcher talking about his hatch organization method and how he organizes a fly box. Grab your notebook, school's in session. This is episode number 51 of the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. Welcome to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show, where you discover tips, tricks, and tools from the leading names in fly fishing today. We'll help you on your fly fishing journey with classic stories covering steelhead fishing, fly tying, and much more. How's it going, everyone? Thanks for stopping by the Fly Fishing Show. In today's episode, I interview Peter Stitcher, the chief fly geek at Ascent Fly Fishing. We talk about how they developed a database of bugs that helps to select the perfect flies for your next trip. Peter shares his pause method, which walks you through understanding what the fish are feeding on um, from starting uh, from your truck until you get into the creek and beyond. Don't miss this one as Peter talks about the huge... Uh, glow-in-the-dark streamers he uses to catch huge trout in tailwaters at night. I wanted to announce a special offer from Ascent Fly Fishing. The first day of Fishmas starts December 6th with 25% off all mayfly patterns. This sale lasts for 24 hours and ends at midnight Mountain Standard Time on the 6th. Go to AscentFlyFishing.com and use the coupon code FISHMASDAY1 to get your special deal. We are also brought to you by the original tie right, which holds flies and hooks securely so you can tie your fly on with little effort. The uh, tie right senior holds hook sizes 2 through 14, and the junior holds hook sizes 14 through 24. Tie right can help you tie clinch, knot, uh, clinch knots and modified clinch knots and many other knots to suit your needs. Head over to tyright.com and get started today. That's T Y R I T E.com. So, without further ado, here's Peter Stitcher from AscentFlyFishing.com. How's it going, Peter? Uh, Dave, it's going great. Thanks for having me on this morning. Yeah, thanks for coming on. We're uh, getting a, a nice early start here, uh, get a good start to the day. I uh, have some questions here. I, I, we were kind of talking about the focus here, and I think we're going to get into a lot on uh, you know bug selection, entomology, flies, and things like that. But uh, before we get into that, maybe we can just... Uh, bring us back to how you got into fly fishing and how you brought that into where you have um, a couple, well, you have a scent fly fishing, but you've got some other like uh, the rendezvous and some other things going on. Absolutely. Yeah. It's uh, our, our whole world here in Colorado kind of revolves around fly fishing. Um, and, and that started at a young age. Uh, my mom taught me to fish when I was little. I got, you know, VHS tapes of, of me and little jam shorts uh, with a bamboo rod in the Smoky Mountains catching my first trout. And uh, yeah, I mean, the river has always been my um, kind of my Zen place. And so um, got a lot of degrees and stuff that I didn't use, but uh, I always went back to the river to, to kind of find my center. And and uh, then I realized that's where I was supposed to be. So yeah, we uh, I'm an aquatic biologist and uh, yeah, my life uh, and that of my family uh, really resolve, revolves uh, around the river. And, and how did you, so it's really cool. I mean, I've actually had, a, as we speak today, uh, an episode with Heather Hotson published that, um, she's, she's leading the United Women on the Fly, this movement that's really cool. She digs into it today, but I mean, that's awesome to hear your mom got you into it. Now, can you tell us a little more about, you know, why, why your mom and, and, and why not your, it seems like a lot of times the dad is the one, but maybe you can tell, fills in on that. Right. Yeah. Well, it's, uh, you know, my dad was, was a busy guy. He was a, a physician. Um, so I think maybe that's where some of the, the interest in the science of, of the world of trout came in. But, uh, yeah, my mom was, was really uh, in tuned and, and saw at a young age that, uh, yeah, I, I love being on the water. And she encouraged me to, to get in the water, get in the mud. And, I mean, I, I'd get a, a wild hare and, and want to go to some lake or, or a river, and she'd get up at 4 in the morning to drive me there. So, you know, I, I hope I can do the same for my kids when, when they're interested in something. That's awesome. That's cool. So, so basically you got in, you got started early and then how can you take us back to just a little bit of that timeline from, you know, getting started early and then how you got into now with the scent fly fishing, how that came to be? 
Right. Yeah. So, gosh, I wish as a as an eighteen year old before I went off to school, I would have just slowed down and uh, and just acknowledged how much I love fly fishing and just gone right into fly fishing at eighteen. But uh, yeah, it was a kind of a, a long circuitous road. Um, I, I ended up uh, getting my first two degrees in theology and international studies. I thought I was going to go live in New Guinea one day and uh, went on to work on a master's in counseling. And and uh, I found myself uh, hoping that my clients wouldn't show up to their counseling appointments because I wanted to go fishing. <laughs> and uh, this was a great uh, you know, indication that I was doing the wrong thing. And uh, so, you know, kind of late in life, I I dropped all that and, and restarted and went back for a third third degree in aquatic biology and uh, you know, just kind of pieced it together. I lived uh, uh, down in Corvallis, Oregon. I spent 150 bucks for a, a bunk in a warehouse and uh, really pursued my passion and, and that was designing, building, managing uh, trophy trout water and uh, yeah, I lived out of my truck for a couple of years surveying salmon water as my, my first job as a biologist. And, and in doing that, I got a, a fish a different water every night and really kind of connect my passion of fly fishing with the science. Um, each night I'd be out in the headwater streams of, of somewhere in Oregon or Washington or Northern California. And, uh, you know, just looking at, uh, you know, a specific root wad that's laying down in the river and how that river worked around that root wad, how those fish utilize that hole that it made. And I just filled up journals and, uh, you know, looked underwater and, and, and sampled and fished these waters. And, uh, yeah, my passion kind of came full circle. And I realized that this kind of intimate understanding of, of the world and the science of trout and salmon um, could be applied to fly fishing. So, uh, yeah, I brought it back full circle. And, um, you know, there's a couple more steps where we moved to, to Colorado um, to, to manage trophy trout fisheries um, in the Aspen Valley. And, uh, and then periodically people would ask, you know, what's, what's happening in this specific water? What's, uh, going on here? And I could say, well, I did the entomological studies there. I actually did the restoration work on this body of water. So this time of year, these are the life cycles of the bugs that are working there. You should fish these, you know, dozen flies. Um, and out of that kind of, um, you know, just random conversation, uh, hatch descent fly fishing. And, and so now... Yeah, this is what I do full time is people tell me when and where they're fishing and we apply all that geeky science and hmm. we help them catch more fish. Nice. Yeah, I want to get into all that geeky science because uh, you are the uh, the chief uh, fly geek uh, for your company. So I wanted to uh, touch base on that. Before I get there, you mentioned uh, a bunk in a warehouse for 150 bucks. Can you take us back to that uh, that period and what, what that felt like? Or right. what, what you're doing there, how, how you've uh, got it, what, what the warehouse was. <laughs> well, I, I should have, you know, my wife, Jessica, you know, get on, on the, on the call and, and explain what that was like for her. But, um, so yeah, we lived in Portland and then, uh, I drive down and spend the week in, uh, in well, a little town outside of Corvallis where Oregon state is called Philomath. And, and, uh, we were just scrapping it together. You know, we had four roommates back home to pay the rent. Um, and, uh, yeah, my wife was pregnant with our first child, and uh, just the, the cheapest place I could find was, you know, there's this old dirty cell phone business, and uh, in the back they had a bunk, and, and I paid $150, <laughs> and in this warehouse complex, there was one bathroom for all these businesses, and uh, just a, an open shower in there with a, a utility sink, and, and that's where, yeah, you know, I spent my, spent my days while I was getting my degree uh, before I'd run back home, and and then I have to run out and spend two weeks uh, in my truck surveying water. So that was just our our pattern back then. That's, but uh, you yeah. make sacrifices, do what you love. Yep. Yeah, that's it. Yeah, you got to do it. Now you're at a point where you've got a company that uh, has a really cool product. I've actually got one of your boxes, and you're actually uh, a sponsor of the sh of the show. So we've got you on. I think the, uh, the last couple of episodes and. So I've, d I've dug into your box and yeah, it's really sweet, uh, really sweet how you have it set up. You know, I, I love it's organized. You've got a card that comes with it that describes all the different orders and, you know, different bugs you're using and things like that. Can you talk a little bit about how you go, um, into the selection on an individual stream, uh, when, when you select these bugs and it, because, you know, somebody calls from say a random spot around the country, how do you, how do you know what, um, what to put in there? 
Right. Yeah. So, you know, what we do through Ascend Fly Fishing is a little unique in the fly fishing world. And we're really trying to, you know, push the envelope and, and open up the water and open up the sport in a new way. Um, so what we build for you and what we do for, for clients around the United States primarily is we build these biologist crafted fly selections specific to the life cycles and bugs on the waters that our clients are fishing exactly when they're fishing them. So the box we built for you was uh, for the Deschutes River, which is what I consider still one of my home waters out in uh, central Oregon. And um, we set that up specifically for kind of late fall through the winter into the early spring, just because I wanted to touch on some of those larger salmon flies for you. Um, but what we do is, uh, yeah, a client will get on our website and they'll answer seven questions. They'll tell us how advanced they are in fly fishing. Some people are brand new to the sport. Some have been fishing for 60 years. Um, and that's going to kind of determine, you know, how specific uh, of flies we're going to get them. If you're, you're brand new, we want to get you flies that are going to, you know, potentially work on a, a longer period and a greater scope of waters. Um, they tell us, uh, you know, I only fish dry flies, I only fish wet flies, or, or they say, you're the biologist. You just choose whatever life cycles and flies are going to be best for this water. They tell us their water, the seasons they're fishing it, and um, in their budget. And then um, we have a database of invertebrates, of bugs, super geeky stuff that uh, someone can be going to the Beaver's Kill River in, in New York, um, the snake in Idaho, um, you know, the metolius, you name it, uh, uh, the, the White River in Arkansas, and you know, answer those questions for us. And our database tells us these are the, the hatches. And based on the time of year, the flows, the water temperatures, um, the air temperatures, we can then determine this is the, the phase in the life cycle, where that bug is at in the water column or, or outside of the water. And then we'll choose the right bugs and, and pack those up and organize them in a box for, for our clients. Hmm. Oh, that's really cool. And then as far as species, do you guys focus, um, I guess, mostly trout? Do you do, you do other species like uh, other than trout? Do you get into bass, that sort of thing? Right. So, you know, some of our flies will certainly cross over to salmon, bass, grayling, some other species. But but trout are really our, our core passion. And they're some of the, the most finicky eaters on the water. So, um, I mean, this is where our, our, uh, our science really shines. Um, you know, currently we have 30 full-time tires and we can tie about 54,000 flies a week. And we keep about 450,000 flies in the shop. So we are exhaustively covering every you know, productive major life cycle of every major hatch um, in our trout waters. And, and we're super uh, you know, prolific uh, for the hatches in the lower 48 states. Um, we can you know, get into some detail uh, for you know, Canadian provinces. Um, and then New Zealand, Patagonia, and now we're starting to flesh out some of our European uh, hatches as well. Mm. But uh, it's it's primarily around trout. Um, but eventually, I mean, this this type of science, this type of uh, you know precision uh, surgical uh, kind of hatch selection, I think this is going to be the future of fly fishing. So we're 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 still growing, and and yeah, we're going to take over the the fly fishing world. <laughs> nice, nice. All right. Well, so so this is a good. Uh, I had Rick Cafe on. I think episode. Well, it was a few episodes back, and he's an entomologist. Maybe you can describe the difference between, uh, for those that don't know, you know, the difference between because you're a biologist, right? I mean, what is the difference between an right. entomologist and a biologist? Or do you? I mean, you you consider yourself an ecologist, or what? What do you consider yourself? Right. So I'm, I'm a freshwater aquatic biologist. And I think the the difference between an entomologist and, and what I do as an aquatic biologist would be, um, you know, he might be a, you know, a brain surgeon, right? He's very sp- specified and, uh, you know, specialized in specifically the, the identification and study of invertebrates, of bugs, whereas um, a freshwater biologist, we're more of a, a general surgeon. So I need to uh, understand water chemistry and how that affects a fishery, fish habitat, and how that river's flowing through this section of, of field. You know, how can we change that to maintain good holding water and habitat? So, um, I, um, you know, my experience is maybe a little bit broader, a little bit shallower, but uh, you know, entomology is certainly a piece of that healthy fishery. So I'm looking at the big picture. And he's a, a specialist in, in gotcha. just the, the foods. Yeah. Gotcha. Yeah, that was because that was the point that he made or I made. I was asking, like, because he's the only entomologist I know in the West. Like, and he's a pretty big name out here. But 
I, I don't hear of any other entomologists. And I asked him that question. He said that there are a lot of them. They have whole ecological societies and, and meetings and stuff, but there's not a lot of them that are actually fly fishermen or, you know, or get into fly fishing and, and cover that. Is that, do you see the same thing on the aquatic biologist side or that there's not a lot of people that are doing what you do? I, I don't know of anyone else who's really specifically doing what we're doing. Um, I mean, there's a, a lot of these, you know, PhD level entomologists and scientists, they're really smart, but, um, you know, to the average fly fisherman, you, you hit them with a bunch of Latin names and their, their eyes are going to glaze over. So, um, sometimes, uh, it's, it's hard to make that connection between this high level kind of science and the sport of fly fishing. So, um, yeah, I, I you know, I think, uh, I'm a passionate educator. Uh, I'm an open book, and and I I really get a lot of pleasure and you know, love unpacking that geeky science stuff and breaking it down to something that that you can tie on the end of your fly line. And and there's no one else really doing that. So, yeah, I, I hope that the rest of the scientific community doesn't catch on. Like I love owning <laughs> this space. Yep. Yeah, it is. That's true. The Latin names, and you get into that stuff. Well. Maybe you could break it down for somebody that maybe isn't going to necessarily buy your box right away. If they wanted to kind of do a similar thing to what you do, what, what would you tell them if they wanted to go to the stream and maybe know a little bit more about what to put on their fly by analyzing the, the aquatic community? Right, right. Um, so, yeah, when I, I'm doing stream side classes or um, we do a lot of classes at breweries, we call them bugs and brews. Uh, we try to, you know, in a, in a couple of minutes, we, we teach people how can you go to, whether it's a new water or a familiar water, how can you go and pick up the menu, bring that into your fly box, and, and at a glance identify these are the bugs and the life cycles that are going to be most productive on this water on this day. So um, we have some really simple acronyms, little phrases that we teach anglers that uh, you know, allow them to just kind of repeat this little phrase in their mind and it'll tell them these are the spots where, where the menu's written. Um, so I described the menu on the river. Uh, it's like a menu at a restaurant, but it's gone through a shredder, right? It's gone through a paper shredder. And so the menu is kind of blown all around the river. Parts of it are going to be under the rocks on the bottom of the river. Some of those pieces are going to be floating down the surface of the river. Some of them are going to be blown over the river in the way that the bugs are flying and we'll see a few pieces, you know, trapped in the spider webs and in the edges and the eddies along the side of the river. So there's five points where this menu is kind of written over the river. And these are the five places where the angler who really wants to hone their game and catch more fish, this is where they need to look. And so um, we've developed a method called the pause method, P-A-U-S-E. And P stands for parking lot to the river. Um, matching the hatch starts at the truck. It starts in the parking lot. And I mean, you can, you can speak to this. I mean, this is a safe place. We're going to be honest, right? Yeah. How many times have you tied on your first, uh, flies at the truck without even getting to the river well, and, and even checking? And yeah. that's exactly it. I'm, I'm already thinking, yeah, before I get there, that's, that's, ex- I already know what I'm going to kind of start off with, but I guess if it's a new river, you might not have that idea. Right. Right. And and the menu's changing throughout the day. So, you know, what worked uh, yesterday evening uh, might not be what's hatching and active, you know, first thing the next morning. So, P, in the pause method, we're looking at um, what's hopping along the trail. Do we hear, you know, the chirp of cicadas as we're, you know, walking up to the, the Flaming Gorge section of the Green River? Um, do we hear crickets? Uh, do you see ants uh, running across the trail? So, um, these observations as we're, we're hiking to the river where we're going to fish – it's going to start to inform which dry flies might be productive. These might be on the menu. Um, as we get to the edge of the river, um, we're looking uh, at the rocks and at the bushes. Um, are there a bunch of insects that are just kind of staging there waiting to return to the river? So as we're pushing through the bushes, um, are we you know, kicking out swarms of caddis flies or, or mayflies? Um, and then we're looking for those stonefly skins that as our stonefly nymphs crawl from the river and hatch, they're going to leave those skins attached to the rocks on the side of the river. And again, this is all, you know, little pieces of information that's going to inform, you know, these are the families of, in the life cycles of the dry flies that might be on the menu. So that's the first place that we're looking. Um, A in the pause method is above the water. So um, what is flying over the water and how, 
are the birds interacting with the river or the lake that we're fishing. So from 100 yards away, walking up to a lake or a river, if you see swallows ducking and diving low over the surface of the water, that means that they are keying into some sort of a hatch. Either it's a swarm of egg-laying insects returning to the water to lay their eggs, or it's a, it's a fresh hatch coming out of the surface of the water. So just as those trout are, are rolling through the water, you know, feeding on those emergers, those swallows will come to the river and greet those emerging insects as soon as they come off the surface of the water. Um, also, each of our, our families of insects, our mayflies, caddisflies, and stoneflies, have a very unique flight pattern that from, yeah, 50 yards from the water, just from how those bugs are flying, you can say, this is a mayfly. I need to be going to the mayfly rows in my fly box. But this A part of the pause method is, again, going to speak to which dry flies are going to be productive on the water. So those are the, the first two points. Um, U is under the water. And I can't you know, emphasize enough how important it is to get your head under the water to turn over rocks, to sample aquatic insects, um, to use a, a fly fishing seine to collect some of the bugs off the bottom of the river. Because this is where our trout are doing the vast majority of their feeding. 99.9% um, .9 of the life of the aquatic bugs that trout eat and about 80% of the food that they eat year round happens under the surface of the water. So if we never reach under the water and and stay in the water or, or sample the under the rocks, we are, we're fishing blind, um, essentially blind. So, um, we, we produce a product called the SciFly saying it's less than $7, but it slips over the basket of your landing net. And then I encourage people go out into the riffles, that fast, shallow water where that river's running downhill and the water's churning and tumbling. It's kind of got some broken white water on the surface. That's where most of our bugs are going to live. They like that riffle type habitat. And we push this fine mesh seine that's kind of wrapped around the basket of our landing net against the bottom of the river, facing up into the current. And then we're going to take our wading boot or our hand and just in those two feet, just upstream of our seine, we're going to dig into the bottom of the river and we're going to flip boulders and we're going to scrub them with our hands or really, you know, scuff them with our boots. And that's going to displace all of those aquatic insects that are kind of growing and living on the bottom of the river. They're going to get pushed up into the current, drift down into our net. And so when we pick that up out of the water, this is a detailed menu of all the aquatic life cycles and families that are present. And it allows us very quickly to then match to the best wet flies in our box. Um, S, we got two more parts in the pause method. So S stands for spider webs. Um, spiders know exactly what's hatching, where you're fishing. So if you can find an active spider web, one where that spider's still sitting right in the middle of that web, any bugs that are still trapped in that web are a really fresh sample of what's hatched from that water or is hopping around the side of the river. And so um, those bugs trapped in that spider web are going to, again, inform which dry flies might be on the menu. And then E stands for edges and eddies. So as this river wraps its way through the landscape, it'll curl around, you know, some old growth root rod up in the Pacific Northwest that's fallen down into the river. Or there'll be a boulder or a, a tuft of grass or a little island, and that water will kind of eddy and current around behind that. And so you'll see a little swirl of foam, just uh, like a little uh, tornado on top of the water. And dry flies that have fallen in the river, return to the river to lay their eggs. Um, insects that have recently hatched will get sucked into that eddy. And it's just a tornado of bug collection. So we'll look on the surface in the foam and then we'll seine again, use that same uh, seine on our net and we'll sample the bottom of that eddy. Um, Cause that it's like a tornado reaching all the way down to the bottom of the river. So it'll be pulling insects that are drifting under the water into the uh, eddy. And so we get both dry fly and wet fly information. Once we've looked at those five points, I mean, this will take two minutes. Ultimately, you'll get pro proficient at this. Um, a lot of this you just take in subconsciously as you're walking to the river and you're filtering it right into your box. And, uh, 
But ultimately, yeah, this is how we assemble all this information. This is where the data is at, right? What's on the menu? Mm-hmm. And then we can choose the best fly patterns. Hmm. That's great. Yeah, the, the pause method, that's definitely – Nice acronym to help uh, remember. Uh, I'll, uh, I'll be using that as I uh, work my way on the next stream for sure. That's that's helpful. So you talked about sampling methods and the uh, the net you mentioned. What what was the net called? We call it the the sci fly sane. Okay. Um, so yeah, S E I N E is sane, and it's just a yeah real fine mesh uh, net that, that slips right over the basket of your landing net, and and we produce that through River Oracle, which is our kind of our where the science meets the sport brand. And so our, our videos and, and match the hatch tools are all via river Oracle. Oh, gotcha. Okay. And then, yeah. And I have an old saying that I actually made a long time ago. That's just a couple of poles. And I found some like just same thing, some fine mesh and stapled it together. But, uh, other than the, uh, the, you know, having something like that, are there any other tools like uh, sampling that they'd want to, somebody would want to get to have the total equipment? Right. And I mean, I am, I'm a minimalist as much as possible. Um, uh, you know, if people come into my shop and, and they tell me they want to spend $40 for X amount of gear, I will look at their box versus where they're going. And I'll say, you know what, you have all the flies you need. You have all the tip that you need. Just get these six flies and get out of here without spending any more money. So I think we need more of that in the fly fishing uh, community is, is transparency and, and not, you know, overcomplicating with too much gear. Um, but there are certainly tools that can, you know, help to connect these pieces on the water um, more quickly. So, um, you know, the saying I think is, is an essential tool. It's like your reel. It's like a spool of tippet. Um, it's just going to make your day so much more productive because you're going to see what they're eating. Um, other, you know, tools as far as um, that, that can be used to really, you know, increase your productivity would be like a fly fishing thermometer. Um, every feeding event in the water is intimately tied to water temperature. Um, so there is a there is a season when each of our hatches are going to kind of come off the water and onto the menu for trout. And there is a, a range of temperature that's going to trigger those bugs to leave the bottom of the river and kind of work their way through the, the world of trout, getting eaten on their way to the surface and, and kind of work through that life cycle. Um, so when I wade, I have this kind of aluminum coated thermometer with a carabiner slip through the laces of my boot. So uh, on the water, as I see a hatch start, I can note the date. I'm like, all right, I'm on, you know, this section of the Deschutes and water temperatures, uh, you know, 59 degrees and the pale morning duns are coming off at, at this time in the afternoon. And so the next day I can go back and, and I can watch that water temperature start to rise, that day start to progress. And, and as soon as it starts getting towards that 59 again, I'll get ready to tie on my PMD mergers because that same temperature is going to trigger and start that same hatch. So temperature is important. Um, trout also have kind of a, a sweet spot of water temperature where they're going to thrive and feed productively. And, uh, and then there's going to be a temperature where they start stressing out and it can potentially become lethal. So, you know, sustained water temperatures above 67 degrees. Uh, I'm resting that water. I'm going somewhere else. I'm going higher in elevation of fish. So that's kind of my do not fish temperature. And, and that, that thermometer is going to tell you when, you know, when we're touching that danger zone. Mm-hmm. And does that tie in pretty closely with just time of day? Or do you see a lot, a lot of variation there where any different day you might have a different temperature? I guess it depends on whether you're what uh, tail water, what type of stream you're looking at as well. Right. Right. Yeah. So there's a lot of variables and you know, what'll affect the temperature. I mean, you could, you know, as fly fisher, uh, men and women were, we're moving, right. We're walking up and down the stream. We're driving up uh, the river and we might have a really wide, shallow section of river that's going to heat up, you know, much faster than maybe a, a deeper section running through a Canyon. So, um, potentially we might see a hatch, you know, start earlier in this warmer, shallower section than we would in that deep, uh, colder section. Um, so cold water springs, depth, uh, kind of exposure to the sun, all of that's going to affect, you know, the water temperatures, but elevation, you know, how high are we is going to be the main factor. Um, so one of my favorite hatches that, uh, used to be the, the salmon fly hatch on the Deschutes and, uh, man, as a young biologist, I'd hear it starting down by the Columbia, you know, low in elevation, right, right where that Deschutes river enters the Columbia river, 
and I kiss my wife goodbye. And I'm like, all right, I'll see you in a few weeks. And I'd start at the Columbia and then I go upstream a couple miles a day. And just that, that slight rise in elevation and, and a little further upstream, it was a little bit colder. And so over a matter of days and weeks, you could stay in front of that hatch just as it's starting and moving its way upstream. And, and, and the angler can move with that. That That's pretty. So, so you would start at the, um, the mouth and just walk your way upstream for three weeks. Well, not walk. I mean, there's, you know, I'm driving. Oh, okay. Yeah. Okay. I was just saying, cause if you're, you're, you're going real extreme, if that was the case, that, that's a good uh, idea. You could really, if you did that, walked every, uh, every step of the stream for like the first hundred miles, that'd be pretty cool. I, I've definitely put hundreds of miles in my boots, uh, on Oregon streams, but, uh, I've never done the, the length of, of the Deschutes. Um, but, uh, I mean, you're going to see this in all the, the, the awesome hatches that we'd love to hit. The, the Mother's Day Caddis Hatch is a huge hatch here in Colorado. It's one that we all want to hit on the Arkansas River. And it's going to start down low um, near a little town called Pueblo. And then over a matter of days and weeks, I mean, you can just you know drive right up along the Arkansas River and follow that hatch. And you just drive until you see the swarm the next evening and you hop off there. The next day, you're, you're up another three or four miles and, and you're right on it again. Mm-hmm. Nice. No, this is uh, this is good stuff. I'm uh, just kind of thinking to myself, trying to put myself in uh, the position of somebody who hasn't done this before. You know, I, I've been, I've still got bugs in my uh, <laughs> in my office that I collected when I was a little kid. You know, that are in uh, formalin and uh, you know, and that whole thing. Um, but yeah, so I'm just thinking, do, have we missed anything? I mean, you really covered the the pause method is great, but I think somebody if they're new to it, they could probably just get to their stream and get a better idea today as far as start sampling some bugs absolutely and and you know this is something just like riding a bike um it's going to be something that, that comes and becomes second nature with time um so yeah i mean fly fishing in, in the world of trout it's it's about patience it's about you know kind of slowing down and watching what's happening on the river and and so we need to be patient with ourselves and uh yeah just enjoy the process enjoy learning and and different pieces of this are going to click over time and and someone's going to you know see oh, I see that bug flying it's kind of moving in in a wave over the river and that's the way mayflies swarm so then they'll they'll identify that tie on that mayfly pattern and maybe have one of the best days ever on the water um it's going to start to click and yeah, they're going to be more productive. And this is something that, that I, on our Instagram uh, and on our, our YouTube page, um, on our Facebook page, I am regularly um, going to a new river almost every week. And I'm working through this process and I'm showing videos of every step. And so, you know, if they want to join us on Instagram at Ascent Fly Fishing, um, you know, they can start to see this process and really it'll become second nature to them. We'll help them reinforce this. Nice. Okay. No, that sounds good. I um, I was just thinking again about somebody that's uh, trying to get into it, or maybe somebody you talk to. What what is the biggest struggle that you hear from your customers or, or clients, people that come in? I mean, the biggest frustrations I think do come around um, not knowing what the flies are in their box or when to fish them. I mean, that's the question of every angler since the first caveman, you know, dunked something in the water. It's like, what are they biting on? And uh, if we can, you know, encourage and, and train anglers to, to be independent and to be, you know, be able to identify this and do this on their own, um, th- they're going to have a, a lifetime of fishing and, and be really successful. Um, learning the flies in their box is another challenge. Um, you know, a lot of us go into a fly shop and we say, what are they biting on? We might recognize some of the names like, yeah, they're, they're biting on hoppers, they're biting on BWO or bluing all of May flies and these caddis. And then they sell us, you know, a dozen flies, they throw them in a dish and we get out to the river and we're like, now what's what, you know, which one's the bluing olive, which one's an emerger. And and that can be really frustrating. And that, uh, you know, then we just start accumulating more flies. They all get shoved in a box. And and at the end of the day, we don't know what they are or or when to fish them. Yep. Or what, uh, what size to use. And, you know, if you find a bug in the stream, that looks like it's a size 14 do you just match that exact size or do you go a little smaller a little bigger i mean lots of questions right that's and that's a great great point um you know as as fly fishers we we use these arbitrary numbers um instead of saying something's an inch long we say well that's a size 10 and uh 
and that doesn't mean a lot to somebody who's new to the sport, but we're, we're using the hook size, right? The, mm-hmm. We're talking about the, the gap between the point of that hook and, and the shank of the hook. That's how we're measuring these hooks. And, uh, yeah, it's kind of our own little lingo, but for a new angler, it can be frustrating. Um, so we have created a, another tool to kind of help bridge that specific gap. Um, the River Oracle magnifier and um, hook size chart, um, you know, it's all about identifying what, what are the characteristics on this bug that are going to tell us first? Is it a mayfly, caddisfly, stone, et cetera? And then after we identify that, what's it look like in our box? So in this little magnifier kit with the hook size chart, we have a little waterproof card. It allows you to drop that bug on the face of it, get a measurement. All right, this bug is, is 10 millimeters. Um, and then you flip that over and you can say, well, all right, well, by these characteristics, that was a stone fly and 10 millimeters is going to tell me it's going to be on a straight shank hook in my box, not a curved hook because it's a stone fly nymph. And then 10, 10 millimeters might be, it'll have a conversion chart there on the other side. 10 millimeters means that's a size 18 to a 20 hook. And then there's the actual hook sizes on there. So you can reach in your box and find that right size. You know, really start to connect the, the hook size with the bugs you're actually seeing. Let's take a quick break from a word from our sponsors. Ascentflyfishing.com has a great sale coming up this Christmas. It's called Fishmas, and it starts on December 6th when you get 25% off all mayfly patterns on that day. The sale lasts for 24 hours and ends at midnight on uh, December 6th. So go to ascentflyfishing.com and use the coupon code FISHMASDAY1 to get your special deal. That's F I S H. M-A-S-D-A-Y-1 to get started. And the, the sale is going to go on for 12 days, so you can keep following um, uh, Ascent Fly Fishing on Facebook and Instagram for daily deals. And I w- just wanted to touch base a little bit more on Ascent, if you haven't heard about them uh, yet on the podcast. They have some really cool products, uh, really unique products, and one of them is this custom fly box selection that I've talked about before. But it's essentially like having a biologist in your uh, waiter pocket telling you exactly what uh, flies to put on. So they have this nerdy uh, database of all the bugs from around the country. Uh, but just want to remind you again, uh, the uh, the big fishmas sale at Ascent Fly Fishing uh, starts on December 6th. And that's when you can get your 25% off all your mayflies. So head over to AscentFlyFishing.com and use the coupon code day one on the 6th to get uh, your deal. The original tie right is a long-standing ex- accessory loved by fly fishermen for decades. It's an accessory you won't live without. After you try it, no more drop flies or hooked fingers. Uh, if you haven't seen this yet, this is pretty simple. It looks like a little pin and has a retractable clip that holds your hook so you can more easily tie on your fly. Finishing the knot is kind of like uh, spinning spaghetti on a fork, um, if you like that analogy. All parts are manufactured and assembled in the USA with a 100% lifetime guarantee. Um, you know, I think about this, like you're on the river, it's a cold November day, you're freezing, you're struggling to put on that little size 18 BWO. Um and um, the tie right is a good example of something that's going to help you. It's like your fingers are kind of like little frozen fish sticks. But, you know, when you have the tie right, it just makes it a lot easier to get that thing tied on because it, it really stabilizes the fly and helps um, to, to spin it and get it in uh, position. Um, this is a great tool from a great company. So I'm excited to share the tie right and uh, have them as a sponsor. Uh, head over to tyright.com and make handling flies a snap. That's uh, T-Y-R-I-T-E dot com to get ready today. So I, I had a question from somebody, uh, one of the listeners out there. They were talking about um, just organizing your box. I mean, you guys do an amazing job at the organization of the box. And maybe you can describe a little bit how you organize the box and how you would recommend somebody who's has a lot of questions to do that. Right, right. And this can seem like a, an insurmountable task for a lot of anglers, but we've really tried to, to make this intuitive and, and as simple as possible. So the box that I sent you and every biologist crafted selection that leaves the shop, we organize according to the families of insects, 
and according to their life cycles in the water. So we call this the hatch organization method. And, and essentially, after studying you know, the life of these bugs as they come from the egg, mature underwater, come out of the water, and kind of progress through that entire life cycle, that's how we lay out our, our flies in the box. So um, one page in the box, we dedicate to all the aquatic life cycles, what's happening under the surface of the water. And we lay out each row almost like a sentence in a book. So on the left side of the row, we have the very earliest life cycle of that bug, fresh from the egg. We put that on the left side of the row. And as we move across each row, then we follow that bug as it grows, as it matures, and then ultimately as it swims towards the surface of the water. So our mergers. We have a midge row, a mayfly row, a caddisfly row, a stonefly row, and then our final rows on this one wet page in the box are dedicated to our edible others. So egg patterns, shrimp, scuds, sow bugs, streamers, helgramites, um, all those oddballs, damsel nymphs, um, worms, leeches. Um, as soon as our hatches hit the surface of the water, the fish start splashing at the surface. They're ready to eat. Uh, they're moving on to the next course in the meal. So then we flip that box over and mirrored on the opposite page on those same rows, we've taught people to identify those flies and organize them by the dry life cycles for each of those families of the bugs. So back on the top row, on the left side, we have the midge, uh, midge pupa breaking through the surface of the water in their first dry life cycle, all the way to the adult midges sitting on top of the water. Next row, we have mayfly duns at the surface of the water, coming to the surface to our spent spinners on the far right side of that row. And then caddis, stones, and then the bottom rows are terrestrials or land bugs, grasshoppers, crickets, ants, things like that. Um, it sounds awesome, right? People are like, yeah, that's. I wish my box was organized like that. I used to organize clients' boxes, and I just don't have enough time to do it. So we created a video, um, and it's titled Creating Order in Your Fly Box, where we go step-by-step. Step, we take this absolutely disorganized pile of flies from all their boxes. We pull them all out, and then in this video, step-by-step, step, we teach them first to separate them into three piles, wet flies, dry flies, and streamers. And then we go to each family, starting with our midges. We say, these are the characteristics. We show videos of the real bugs on the water. We animate. This is what the real midge larva, the real midge pupa looks like. And these are what we're looking for to identify that on the water. And then we show you, these are the same characteristics in our fly box, in our fly patterns that make these dozen patterns midge larva patterns. This is what we're looking for. We pause the video. We pull them out together. And we pack that first row together. And then we pack the second row as we move through each of these families, each of these life cycles. So it's it's nice and slow. People can do it at their own pace. But at the end of this video, they can identify every bug on the water at a glance, every fly in that seine, every fly in that spider web, and then intuitively go to the right row on the right side of that box, and they're ready to join that hatch exactly where it's at. So um, that video is available on DVD and uh, digital streaming. They can, they can stream it on any nice, device nice and all uh yeah this uh, episode here will be at uh, wetflyswing.com slash 51 so i'll have uh, links to to that uh video and the other uh, information we're talking about today so um yeah this is this is really cool we, we've uh i mean i think covered a ton of stuff that's going to be super helpful for a lot of people here i i did have a question i like to ask all my guests and this one is probably going to be tough for you but um Maybe you can think of your home water that you fish. Do you have a couple, two or three go-to flies if you had to pick pick a couple? Right. Yeah. So, I mean, my home waters have changed. I would have, I, you know, would have said the Metolius and the Deschutes uh, back home in Oregon, but but Colorado's home now. So, um, yeah, there's a, a number of tailwaters here in the Rockies that are super productive and grow huge fish below these reservoirs. So I'd say either the Taylor or the frying pan tailwaters are, are certainly some of my favorites. And for any listeners who are like, oh, I can't believe you gave that away. Every angler already knows about these, all right? But uh, these are mycy shrimp tailwaters. So right between 120 and 150 CFS, 
cubic feet per second shooting out of these dams, they just suck loads of these shrimp out of the bottom of the reservoir and shoot them out to the trout uh, in the river downstream. And, you know, these are the tailwaters that you have a chance to catch that, you know, 26, 28, 30 inch trout with just fat rolling over your fingers. And particularly, um, I love fishing at night. This is when a lot of those big browns kind of come off the bottom of the river, come out from the undercut bank and, and just, you know, lose all their inhibition and gorge. So we tie what's called the Martian Mices. And um, it's a mice shrimp that glows in the dark. And uh, we created this pattern because at night, trout lose the perception of color. They don't see color. They only see in black and white. And so this glow-in-the-dark Mices um, just is radiant in the water. And it's like a parking a UFO over a trailer park. It's just going to suck them all suck all the fish out of the river and uh, we'll have 80 fish days on some of these uh, tailwaters with the shrimp and uh, in big fish. Um, so that's just one of the ways that we're kind of hacking the science, tying that into our flies. Um, but yeah, those two tailwaters in particular uh, at night with those glow and dark mices are, are exceptional. Um, yeah. And uh, gosh, I mean, I, I do a lot of high mountain lake fishing um, in the Rockies. Um, We've had a really low snowpack year, like 10 to 7% this last year. So the, the rivers were hot, so that it forced a lot of us to, to go higher in elevation and fish the lakes. Um, but if you're willing to hike a little bit, and this is true in, in Oregon, Washington, I mean, California, you name it, um, you can get to some really secluded, unpressured waters with, you know, 20, 24-inch cutthroat and with large golden trout. Um, there's some lakes in the, the Rockies that still have uh, you know, 26-inch brook trout if you're you're willing to hike. And, and so I love going up there and chasing those uh, reclusive mm. monsters. Nice, nice. So so fishing in the dark, that's something that uh, probably a number of people haven't, haven't done before. Can you, you know, tell us what that feels like or what that experience is like? Right. So um, it, it's, it's different. You know, during the day in a lot of these waters, like the Dream Stream on the South Platte, um, yeah, it's, it's known for these huge, uh, you know, cutthroat and browns and, and even some kokanee in the fall. Um, during the day we're fishing size 22 midges, we're fishing size 22 mayfly nymphs, but at night all, all bets are off and we're throwing larger profiles. And this is going to be true, um, throughout, you know, whatever water you're fishing at night, you want your bug or your streamer to have a large enough profile that it's going to cast a shadow, um, be visible in that low light. So we start exaggerating the sizes of our, uh, of our patterns. Um, so maybe I'm fishing size 12 streamers, uh, during the day at night, I'm fishing size fours. Um, I'm fishing large articulated streamers. Um, again, a lot of the bigger fish that we don't see during the day come out at night. Um, so especially in the fall, I'll fish a lot of mouse patterns. So short, heavy leader, and um, another pattern we tie is called the Martian mouse. And it's, it has glow-in-the-dark flash off either side of the belly. And it looks like that moonlight playing on a wake in the middle of the night. And these big, you know, high 20-inch trout will crush big mouse patterns. So large profiles, splashy. Um, we're trying to displace water. Uh, where we're trying to be kind of smooth and, and, and land our flies lightly on the water during the day, when we're splashing it at night, um, those trout are going to key in on that and they're going to come investigate. Um, and then a lot of glow in the darks, um, because trout don't see color, they really rely on contrast, light on dark, silver on black, white on black. And then those glow in the dark patterns, um, you know, glow in the dark, uh, Martian midges and Martian mouse and, uh, you know, glow in the dark worms all those are really gonna stand out and catch big fish nice, at night. nice. Yeah, i was just uh remind me of uh, the episode 48 uh that i did with uh, landon mayor we talked a lot about some of the big streamers and some of the the crazy uh crazy stuff but there's also some smaller flies you use too right some small like micro do you guys get into the smaller streamer stuff or is it pretty much at night it's as big as you can get you know um you know i, I tend to fish larger at night but 
there certainly are seasons for the micro streamers and and landon is is certainly uh you know probably the the king of of the dream stream and and one of the best uh anglers at catching those you know really trophy trout here in the rockies um but you know micro streamers like those little size uh 12 to 16 uh little marabou leeches and whatnot um i typically fish those more in the early spring uh, maybe just prior to or after the rainbow spawn um and that's just due to the life cycle of our leeches is going to be quite early uh, in that time of the year, so we're going to be fishing smaller bugs, and and I'm just dead drifting those micro leeches, almost like a, a nymph. The water's too cold at those times of year for them to move, um, but those can be kind of a tantalizing, you know, big bite of food for those early mm. spring trout. Nice, nice. I was thinking a little bit as you're talking about, again, getting back to the bug selection, and maybe this is more long-term stuff, but one of the big challenges it seems like for you guys would be um, – you know, the East versus West, like, you know, because the bug communities are right. different East and West. And then factor that in with like gl- global warming and maybe a changing environment. How, how do you, how do you look at all of that? And how do you decide and make sure you make good selections based on that? Right. Um, I mean, global warming is a, a big issue. I mean, there's, there's no alternative facts here. Um, it is going to shift the range of trout and in the communities of bugs that are in those waters. Um, so, uh, yeah, with, I look at that with trepidation, um, you know, it's, our waters are under attack and, and I encourage your listeners to, um, you know, get engaged with their local conservation groups, specifically Trout Unlimited and become advocates for the river. Um, and, uh, but, uh, yeah, East coast versus West coast versus Midwest. Um, there are very diverse, uh, families of bugs. So, um, that is a, an ongoing project, uh, you know, I think we carry about 3,500 different fly skews in the shop right now. And we are, we're adding every month to, you know, I'm assiduously trying to fill in the holes in the hatch and, um, you know, work on, on new ISO patterns and new hex patterns that they're, they're nowhere close to where I live, but, uh, I, I want my, uh, my East coast and West coast uh, English to, to be on the hatch. And so, you know, we're committed to, to tying those, um, but yeah, in the, in the next 10 years, in the next 20 years, I mean, it's going to be telling. Um, I mean, the rivers are are going to be one of the first uh, casualties, I think, uh, unless we kind of get a hold on on global mm-hmm. warming. Yeah, I was uh, I was thinking as as you're chatting there. I um, oh, let's see what what episode was it? The the fly fish food uh, crew. Uh, oh, I guess I don't have that handy, but um, I asked them the same question, kind of because they they're similar to you. They're they're covering the entire country and even going outside. Um, and yeah, and that is a challenge. And, and I think the point they made is that uh, they have people that are testing out their, you know, their flies or, or you know, there's people they kind of know all along the industry. So they're able to uh, qualify. But but on the other hand, I've also talked to people that, you know, are just making up stuff and like, you know, and just trying it. You know, I mean, steelhead maybe is a little bit different than trout fishing. But Jay Nicholas early on in episode three, you know, said he was doing videos and putting them out there that, you know, he had really never even used the fly much, but you know, I mean, they still catch fish, right? I mean, you don't have to be, it doesn't all have to be scientific. I mean, what's your take on that as far as just trying new stuff, tying new flies and testing things out? Right. Yeah. I, I love it. I mean, I, I love uh, when someone comes in the shop and they, they show me some, some random floss and, and marabou type uh, fly they came up with. And, and I think uh, there, there's certainly something to be said, uh, how trout will be, you know, they'll respond to something that looks a little different than, than the norm. Um, and so I love the innovation. I love the creativity. And, um, I mean, attractor patterns, these flashy oddballs or, or flies with some exaggerated, you know, big old white wings or big rubber legs. Um, they go, they have a, you know, a unique spot in the box and that they just, they anger, they piss off, they seduce the aggression of those trout. And, and these oddballs are always going to catch fish. So um, I love seeing the innovation, and, and that's a really uh, cool part yeah, of the sport. Is, yeah, I, I just and I found the it was uh, yeah Curtis Fry uh, on episode forty uh, chatted. Uh, we talked about some similar stuff. They're obviously not not quite at the level as far as the entomology and things that you're doing, but um, that was a, that was a good show as well. So uh, yeah, well we we are getting into this one. We're pretty far along, um, but I wanted to check. Um, you know, as far as, you know, we talked a little bit about your life, but as, as you look back, is there a story that, uh, you know, maybe like one thing that helped influence you to, to get to where you are? 
You know, I think, um, yeah, my, my family, I think, has really been a driving force behind, you know, me having the, the, the courage and also the support to to really, you know, put it all on the line and, and uh, you know, hang our hat on a concept that has been, been tested. Um, you know, the fly fishing industry um, is, has been the, done the same way for a long time. And so people coming in with, with new ideas, it's, it's looked at with some, uh, some uh, skepticism. But, uh, gosh, it was probably – Six years ago, my my we thought my dog was gonna lose a kidney, and so I'm working as a biologist, and uh, and on the side, I'm like, I need to we need to pay for this kidney surgery. So we started tying flies like crazy, and this that was really the the impetus for uh, the for you know reaching out and telling people like you're fishing on this water, let me tie you up three dozen flies that are gonna really match what's happening there, and so we was trying to to you know pay for for these surgeries for my daughter, and and ultimately she came out well. Um, but, but from that, we saw the response, and we started to get the photos back from these people that that were uh, you know, catching big fish on our flies, and uh, and that you know really drew us into you know, maybe I can leave you know this full time biology position and, and start doing this a little bit more on the side, and uh, and then my wife Jessica has been you know steadfast, 100 percent in the business, and and a great partner, um, totally believing in me, so. Uh, I mean, it's hard to make a living in the fly fishing industry, but when you have you know, your best friend as your partner, as your business partner, um, uh, it can be a lot of fun. So, you know, I really appreciate her, you know, believing in what we're doing. And the community has been phenomenal as far as, you know, uh, supporting and, and reaffirming that, that they like what we're doing and how we're opening up the sport. Um, you know, it, we're not your standard shop. Um, we don't have a brick and mortar location. We're primarily online. Um, and, and I put my mobile on the website. So people call me from all over the U S and, and I will give you information for free. I'll tell you what's hatching. I'll tell you what flies are working. And, uh, that kind of open mentality is, uh, without, you know, need to, to be paid all the time. That's, that's pretty unique. Um, but, uh, yeah, what we're doing is, um, we're trying to open up the sport. We're trying to provide opportunities. So as we've grown, you know, we, we hire street youth from Denver every week to have a spot come in. You know, you work with us, we'll do laundry. We'll have awesome meals, and we're going to pay you. Um, we do classes for the deaf community um, uh, on the water uh, with signers. Um, the LGBTQ community is welcome to come and learn how to fly fish here. Um, and, uh, and then, you know, we have 35 uh, tires and managers overseas, so we'll be spending November with them and and now 3% of, of our sales are going to community development, to education, to health care, to solar power. And, and that's what we consider success. You know, it's, we don't have all the biggest brands in, uh, as, a, as some of the shops do, um, but uh, you know, we're, we're making an impact in our community and on the water here and, and hopefully around the world. So, yeah, that's mm-hmm. what we're passionate about. That's an awesome story, yeah, from – from uh, yeah, that was uh, it must have been pretty intense going back to your daughter with the surgery. I mean, how do you, you know, how how do you put that, uh, you know, when you have moments like that in your life and pers- put everything in perspective? I've never I've never been in that situation where you know kids were in a situation like that. What, what, what does that whole thing feel like? Yeah, it's a you know you you it's you're desperate. You know, you do anything mm-hmm. for those little ones. And it makes you you get it all in perspective. It's not about catching and, and putting the biggest fish on Instagram, but it's um, it's about family and it's about community and it's about uh, you know working together for a, a common good. Um, and in my daughter, she's she's healthy. Nice. She's going to be seven here in a couple months, and she can roll cast a nine foot five weight like a spay rod, and she can ID <laughs> any bug on the river, and she can tie most of them uh, for her own box. So. Um, yeah, that's the legacy. And, uh, so she's an absolute spitfire and, uh, yeah, she'll I'll fish me sometimes. So she's, that's cool. Yeah. That's, that's the legacy we want. Cool. Yeah. Continue. You mentioned, uh, so going overseas, so you have some tires overseas and you're spending some time with them. Whoa. Yeah, we do. Yeah. So, uh, people ask, you know, do you tie all these flies? I'm like, I, I, I appreciate their, their vote of confidence <laughs> that I can tie, you know, 54,000 flies a week, but I'd say 98% of, com- of commercial flies are tied overseas, either Sri Lanka, Thailand, um, Kenya. 
Um, those are the, the main three. And so in 2014, we opened uh, our first factory, 2016, our second. And so, um, yeah, we'll be spending November with our tires in Kenya. I have a uh, 100, you know, Whiting, Meps, and, and Hoffman uh, caves I'm bringing with me. So we, we supply all the materials. We try to get over there regularly for training. And, and these are our, these aren't our employees. These are our family. Um, and so my wife speaks conversational Swahili. Our mm-hmm. kids will be there. And, uh, yeah, um, you know, their, their dreams, their passions, the opportunity that they're seeking for their families, you know, kind of mirrors the opportunities we go to the river to look mm-hmm. for, right? Um, you know, a little taste of life. So, yeah, we will be there uh, training. Uh, we'll be shooting a documentary and hopefully uh, submitting it to some film tours. But, yeah, we want to introduce the, the artisans behind the flies, show their lives, and the opportunities that, that fly fishing has kind of created and built these vibrant communities, and, and specifically the one that's kind of grown around our small factory, mm. um, you know, paying for open heart surgery for our manager's son, paying for education, and, and this year we'll be, be bringing solar power. And, and so a percentage of all of our fly sales goes to, to support uh, this community on top of their average mm-hmm. wages. That's really cool. That's really cool. I was getting back to your, you know, more of your story when you look at, um, you know, you, you, you kind of jumped off or went in full time into the fly fishing. Was there a time when you kind of had the, the day job and then you just jumped and said, okay, I'm going on. Can you, can you remind me again what that was like and take us to that moment? Or, or was it, or was it that right. big of a, a jump or was it more of a, a transition? It was, uh, you know, um, people, uh, they regularly ask like, so are you doing this full time now? And, and I laugh and I said, man, if I was only doing a full time, that'd be a break. I, I wish I was only doing a full time. So, um, for a lot of people trying to break into the fly fishing industry, it's, it's in addition to, you know, full time plus work. So, um, I started tying up with a small group. We tie up like 600 dozen flies just after Emily's uh, kidney surgery. And uh, so I'd be working full time across the West as a biologist, come home on the weekends. And I would have, you know, this was years ago now, but collected all these campaign signs and, and home for sale signs, you know, stuff abandoned on the side of the road. And I'd repaint them fly fishing sale. And, I, for three hours, I put out 160 of these signs within a four-mile <laughs> radius of where we'd be holding a sail. And it was like putting the flies on the water. And people would be driving around. They'd follow this chain of signs in. And I'd have, you know, we'd have tied up 600 dozen flies over a matter of months. And, and we'd have these big events. Um, so we did that on the side to the until the time that I was making more on a weekend uh, doing flies than I was uh, in a month as a biologist. And, and I said, you know, there's something here. Uh, let's try it. And, uh, so yeah, we have a lot of big projects, uh, on the line, mobile apps, um, you know, just a bunch of cool tools, a bunch of good videos that we're really, you know, committed to, to transforming the face of fly fishing, how it's done and really empower, um, anglers with the knowledge to, to be successful. Cool. Uh, I was looking at some of your old social, uh, I mean, I don't know if it was tweets or whatever, but I saw something about, uh, uh, hashtag fear the beard is that something that uh, was related to you in the past or you know I, that was a uh, gosh i mean we we have a social media manager now that kind of manages a lot of the stuff but um yeah we were going to do a fear the beard friday where you know we wanted those anglers with those really epic beards i mean i want a picture of, of courtney from blue halo with his his <laughs> belly length beard um but yeah i mean just fun stuff it's uh you know it's silly and uh yeah, it's, I, I don't know, other people probably have used Fear the yeah. Beard, but uh, yeah, it's about community, it's about fun, it's not about just... Have you ever had a, a crazy beard or a big a beard at all? Yeah, well yeah. Oh, I'm you are, oh cool. Now. It's, okay. You know, yeah, it's uh, it's getting a little bit more yep. gray, which my wife tells me is distinguished, right. but... Uh, you hate it, you hate it, I'm gosh, gonna I hate it, I hate it, but... You know, it makes good trico tails. So, you know, there's oh, there you there's go. a use there at least. Nice. I'll, I'll remember that. Cool. So, man, I got yeah, so many questions I want to dig in and I want to get into the uh, the rendezvous. But I do have kind of a, a newer question I haven't really asked many people. And, I, you know, I think what you've got going is, is really cool. You're doing some kind of new stuff out there. 
Um, but I kind of think in, you know, controversial or, or I kind of mentioned this before, but is there any, does that, you know, when you, you think of that, is, does anything comes to your mind when you talk about kind of, you know, just your life or really getting into what you're doing now that there's controversy or has this all been pretty, pretty smooth transition for you getting into to, to doing what you're doing? You know, I think, um, you know, I, I'm pretty much angler facing, so I don't, I don't interact a ton with, uh, with, uh, other shops. Um, I think, uh, you know, traditional fly shops and, and the big fly manufacturers, what they're doing is, is essential. I mean, they are, have been the, the backbone of the industry, um, but doing something new. I mean, potentially someone could see it as, as threatening. Um, but, uh, yeah, we haven't had uh, backlash. I mean, we've had a lot of you know, warm embraces from the industry and, uh, you know, there's, a lot of affirmation. So, you know, you know, kind of the heroes in the industry, you know, Dave Whitlock, um, is, has been gracious enough to, you know, watch my video, to review that for me, to give me feedback. He and Emily, um, you know, Landon, uh, Mayor and Pat Dorsey have, have been in you know, Dwayne Redford have been gracious enough to, to come to my events and, and speak at my shows and, and then, you know, review products for me. Um, so it's been a, it's been a fairly warm embrace and, and the people that, are dedicated to seeing the sport of fly fishing grow to, to getting people on the water and empowered to catch fish. Um, they're buying into what we're doing and they're supporting us. And, and those are the the type of people that, that we definitely want to partner with and work mm-hmm. with as well. Cool. cool. So, uh, yeah. And you, we talked, you got a ton of resources. It sounds like, and I've, I've seen some of them out there. Is there, are there any other resources you'd recommend? Maybe some stuff that's not your own that is either online or, you know, maybe books that you're, you're into things that other people can dig in that maybe something else that's out there. So YouTube, I think is a, a really good medium for, to get a lot of information in a couple minutes. Um, mm-hmm. so good YouTube channels, um, Kelly Gallup, uh, from Montana has a lot of videos on, on his different, uh, you know, uh, yeah. check nymphing type rigs and, and fishing big streamers. Um, and then, uh, our, our YouTube channel, we're trying to break down a lot of the fly fishing terminology and techniques. Um, so as we enter the fall spawn, we have videos on how do you ethically fish during the spawn? How do you identify active trout red so that you're not damaging, uh, you know, kind of the, the eggs in the next generation. Um, and then our most recent video was on, um, dry fly floatants. All the marketing says every brand is the best brand, but we break down the four categories of floating when to use each, and then we show you how they actually compare uh, on the water. So which one is the winner for, for long-term floating? So YouTube, I think, is, is probably the next uh, big venue for, for educating anglers. Hmm. Okay. Yeah, no, I love YouTube. I think um, I've got a little channel out there, and I just, yeah, Kelly and everybody else, they've got awesome stuff. I I was kind of thinking on another uh, random question here, and more of this is about your, your company, um, you know, how are you guys, as far as you look at Apple, uh, you know, maybe the, the good and bad sort of thing, but this company that's kind of, you know, I mean, how many people have an Apple phone or, you know, a Mac and all that stuff. How are you guys similar to Apple, do you think? The whole, the whole, if you look at the history of uh, what, you know, where Apple has come from. Well, I guess what Apple started in a garage, right? So I think we, we, uh, we have a garage story, that's for sure. Um, mm-hmm. But yeah, it's, I mean, that's, that's some pretty big shoes uh, to fill or, or a pretty grand comparison. Do, do, do yeah. you take, I mean, could you take, I mean, when you look at your business, do you look at some of these companies that have been, you know, have gotten huge or done some great things and kind of try to do some of the similar stuff? Or are you just on, on your own, kind of just doing your thing, trying to serve your customer? You know, the customer certainly is, is, is number one. I mean, whether it's, you know, it's a doctor looking to, you know, spend 200 bucks or if it's a, we had these two boys that would ride their bikes over from when, like, when they were 13 till they were, you know, 16. They'd ride their bikes over once a week and spend three dollars each. And I would spend the same amount of time going over maps and dropping pins on Google Maps and talking about flies with those two as I would any other, you know, one percent type doctor. So, um, yeah, I, there's no, uh, you know, no divide there. It's uh, it's inclusion for all. Um, we have a vision and we have tools marked out and things that we think are going to transform the industry and, and put the power and the knowledge. All of our databases, all the geeky stuff we do is going to be 
available for the angler on their phone. So that's where we're growing. Mm. And nice. uh, and we're not going to stop until we've given birth to these and really seen this sport kind of you know reach its pinnacle and, and anglers be empowered. And it's not just about empowering them to catch fish. As they they learn about the bugs and the relationship uh, with these rivers and the watersheds around them, they're going to be advocates for these rivers. And uh, so we've, in the last three years, probably given away 3,000 Trout Unlimited memberships. Um, mm. So we are trying to build citizen conservationists and people that are going to stand up for and vote and advocate for our rivers and, and then share this with, with other people. Um, mm-hmm. Yeah. Cool. Cool. Now, maybe we can get a little bit into the uh, the rendezvous. You talk about the event, and is that the main event that you do? And is that, is that an annual event? So, yeah, the fly fishing rendezvous is a Rocky Mountain fly fishing show that we started in 2014. And I mean, as a young company, we couldn't afford booths at the larger shows, um, so we we started the rendezvous in a 40 by 40 foot room in a rec rec center with nine other companies and 200 people showed up to our first event. So here we are on our seventh event. We're just uh, going to be booking our, our, our next space. But, yeah, we'll have about 20,000 square feet and hopefully, you know, 100 different uh, fly tires, uh, fly fishing companies um, and, and authors joining us. And uh, so the emphasis of this event is, is education. Uh, and in the past, it's been very Rocky Mountain focused, but I think we're going to open it up a little more regionally. But last year we had 55 different um, fly tires, vendors, authors, and speakers um, in, in 10,000 square feet. And we had 40 hours of classes over two days. So it's casting clinics, fly tying, uh, numbers of lessons. Um, so, the, yeah, the fly fishing rendezvous is still something that, that we're, we're building and, and, and looking to grow here in the Rockies. Um, but I'll also be speaking at um, the Texas Beer and Fly Fishing Festival um, down in uh, Plano, Texas this January. I'll be down there. I'll be at the fly fishing show in Denver speaking, and then we'll be at ISC here in Denver as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, I, I try to get to a number of shows and, and if there's trout unlimited groups or, or other fly fishing clubs, and we, we travel around the U S to kind of bring our, our geeky science, uh, form mm-hmm. of fly fishing to them. And the Denver fly fishing show, how is the, how would you say the rendezvous is uh, different from the, the Denver show? Right. Yeah. The, the Denver fly fishing show is, exceptional it's massive um i mean you have companies from around the the u.s around the world there um in the past uh the fly fishing rendezvous has been uh, more focused on rocky mountain brands uh so the the small grassroots companies that were born here uh, sitting next to large established you know companies like ross reels and, and things like that um also all the authors uh and speakers and fly tires have been based here in the Rockies, really educating our anglers on our waters. So as it grows, we're going to open that up a little bit. But yeah, the Denver Fly Fishing Show is is definitely uh, worth a visit. As is the, you know mm-hmm. the, the Texas event, and um, there's a there's a wealth of knowledge and, and a lot of unique classes and, and opportunities at each. Mm-hmm. And is the the Denver size show? I mean, is that something you you would strive for with the the rendezvous eventually getting to something where it's humongous like that? I don't think so. I think uh, I mean I, I I miss the intimacy if I can't uh, you know get one on one with people and look at their box and and really speak mm-hmm. specifically to what they're doing. I miss that. So um, you know I I don't have a desire for that. My our our big goals are around the mobile apps, around the tools that are going to scale and, you know, be in your hand on the water or, um, you know, really unpacking the science to make exceptional anglers. That's where we want to grow. Yeah. Do you have any tips for somebody who maybe wants to start a little event? I actually, it was funny this morning. I was just thinking before we came on, I was just thinking like, wow, it, it'd kind of be cool to have like an online summit fly fishing and putting something together like that would be pretty cool. Any tips for somebody trying to get started doing something similar to what you've done? Gosh, on, online um, would be, that's that's a unique idea. I haven't thought about that. Um, for like a physical gathering and event, um, the fly fishing community is intimate. It is small and it's, uh, it's built on reputation and it's built on, you know, people buying into what you're doing. So, um, you know, I appreciate you know, guys like Robert Younghands and Pat and Rick Takahashi and, and Landon Mayer and Dwayne Redford. Um, you know, these groups have, you know, these individuals have kind of believed in and invested in what we were trying to do prior to 
you know, when we could pay them for their time. So, um, you know, I think partnering with, with respected names in the industry and treating them well, um, you know, we have uh, partnered with uh, several nonprofits. Um, and so Trout Unlimited um, gets 10% of the door, and, and they've been a, a big partner. A um, number of nonprofits, uh, Casting for Recovery, Project Healing Waters, Trout Unlimited, they all get free space at, at our events. And so, uh, yeah, it's about, you know, giving back and supporting those that are supporting our vets and supporting those in need and, and disenfranchised communities and, and standing up for our waters. So I think, you know, find uh, established partners to support and bring visibility to, and, and they will bring visibility to what you're doing. And, and again, it's built on relationship. So, yeah, um, yeah, 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 you're in this, cool. yeah, you'll, you'll get to know people pretty quickly and if you're doing yeah. it well. Totally. Yeah, that's it. Building relationships. Just, there's no uh, there's no secret. You got to put in the time and get to know people. And I'm kind of seeing that with the podcast. I mean, I'm getting close to a year. Actually, I'm I'm pretty close to my my first year in in the uh, the episodes here every week for uh, for a year. And uh, yeah, man, I, I've I've gotten to know a lot of people that I didn't know before, and it's been awesome to connect. I mean, just like you yourself, you know, I would never have you know, imagine that I'd be connecting with, uh, you know, kind of the sponsors and having people from Colorado and around the country. So yeah, it's a, it's a, I think that's the reason why people stay with it because the community is such a, such a cool community. It is. And it's growing. And I, I hope that's, I mean, what you're doing is a marathon. I respect the consistency and consistency is, is going to be key in, in growing an event or growing a podcast or growing a business here. But, uh, um, yeah, what, you know, the, the community is growing. The rivers are going to be more crowded. Um, so, you know, venues like Wet Fly Swing um, and the Fly Fishing Rendezvous, um, these should be platforms to really educate this this new um, wave of anglers so that they can sustainably and ethically, you know, be on the water and that we can respectfully share it together. Um, and so, yeah, it's I love what you're doing. And, and we need to keep doing it. Otherwise, yep. you know, the river can get ugly and we don't want that. No, it's and, and actually we're, we're getting pretty close to wrapping up here, Peter. But I, yeah, I mean, I was just chatting with it. it kind of blew me away a little bit. I, I knew this was happening, but uh, the Drake um, uh, podcast, you know, um, which is great. You know, Elliot, yep. um, he, he just announced yesterday that he, he's he, it's turning off the, uh, the episodes here pretty soon. At least he's moving. He's moving on to something different. And, um, and he's such a great, uh, you know, he does such a great job with that podcast. I'm kind of definitely bummed to not have that one around, but who knows, maybe somebody will step up and, uh, talk to Tom and, and get, keep that going. But, um, right. so, um, yeah, as far as the podcaster podcasting space, it's for me, I think the more people we have out there doing this stuff, the better. So I'm going to help try to teach people to get into this as well. And yeah, there's, I mean, you, uh, gritty angler, Tom Rosenbauer with Orvis, uh, two guys in a river. I mean, there is mm-hmm. there is one for for every demographic people that are hardcore those that are just getting into it and uh, yeah I think we, we're sharing a, a common goal and a, a common mission and yeah I mean I'm excited to see uh, how the fly fishing community grows. Yep, for sure. Okay, well I'll let you get out here in a sec, but I just had two quick questions. Uh, one one really big and one a little smaller. Um, you know, a hundred years from now um, or whatever time in the future, what what do you want to re- uh, be remembered for? You know, I, I I won't be remembered in a hundred years, but uh, yeah. <laughs> well, fifty. Or you're gonna be re- somebody's gonna remember. You got enough stuff out there that's not gonna just right. disappear. Right. I mean, if 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 you know, the hope would be to be thought as somebody who is inclusive and welcoming. That I mean, if I ever you know reach any sort of fraction of a level of Dave Whitlock or Lefty Cray, um, you know, Gary Borger, these, these men, and there's a number of women in the industry that are just so welcoming and no matter how big they get or, or how many books they have, they will always look you in the eye and greet you and and talk and listen to your stories. Um, I hope that I am always, uh, you know, remembered as someone that I'll, that'll listen and, and, and celebrate, you know, a picture of a six inch brook trout with a, with a, a first time angler and, uh, and always give them my, my full attention. So that's all I want to be is to be present and, and to be, mem- yeah. be remembered for that, you know, a good advocate, uh, an ambassador for the industry. 
Perfect. And do you have a book uh, idea coming up here? That's one way to get get something out there for the long term. We do. Yeah, we have. Uh, we're going to be working on some more streamable content, but uh, we have uh, uh, an illustrator um, in Wisconsin. His name's uh, Alonzo, and he's doing uh, about 200 new invertebrate illustrations for us. So we'll have a waterproof oh, wow. uh, streamside uh, match the hatch book uh, coming up Sweet. here. Sweet. Um, so hopefully sooner than later. That's awesome. Yeah, that's going to be a killer resource. Cool. So, all right. Well, in the next six to 12 months, we've talked about a little, a few things, but anything else we haven't talked about that you got upcoming here? Well, I appreciate the the time on here. I mean, the, the show circuit, you know, in Texas and, and the fly fishing show is going to be the next big thing uh, after after training the tires. But yeah, I encourage people, um, you know, your listeners, if they want to learn to fly fish, we have four and a half years worth of articles on our blog, um, on our website. We have a number of new tools coming out, the YouTube page, the podcast on the website. Um, we are committed to, to giving them the tools, the knowledge to be successful. So I hope that they check it out. If they need gear, um, shoot, we're a fraction of the price of any other shop. But also, uh, we gave you a mm-hmm. discount code, um, Wet Fly yep. Swing. Uh, we'll get them 10% off of their first order. So I hope they'll, they'll let us hook them up for the next trip to the river. For sure, yeah, and those those links will be in the show notes at, uh, as I mentioned, uh, episode fifty one. And uh, cool. So, and the, if they want to find you, yeah, just head over to ascentflyfishing dot com, and they can get all these resources. You'll have links over there to your YouTube channel and uh, anywhere. Else, anything else you want to touch on before we head out of here? No, that's it. Yeah, follow us on Instagram if you want. You know, stream side videos as they happen. We're we're always matching the hatch. So, yeah, I appreciate it. Cool. Thank you so much, David. Yeah. Hey, Peter, I just want to thank you again for coming on. I, um, you know, as I mentioned in the show, uh, you know, I've got one entomologist I know, so I, have added you to the the mix now. So you're my, my, uh, you know, kind of the second person I know. So I'm hoping we'll get some more people that'll come out of the book, but I I appreciate you sharing all your knowledge and uh, and digging into this stuff today. I know people are going to love this one. So we'll talk to you soon. Thank you, Dave. All right. Have a good day. See ya. Bye. So there you go. If you want to find all the show notes with all the links we cover, just go to wetflyswing.com slash 51. And if you get a chance, please subscribe to the podcast. This is the fastest way to help new fly fishers find the show and catch more fish. Go to wetflyswing.com slash subscribe to find out more. Thanks again for stopping by to check out the show today. I'm looking forward to catching up with you soon and hope to connect with you on the river or online. Thanks for listening to the Wet Fly Swing Fly Fishing Show. For notes and links from this episode, visit wetflyswing.com. And if you found this episode helpful, please subscribe and leave a review on iTunes. And also, if you're still hanging around, power to you. Can you send me another double lightning bolt emoji to your favorite favorite social media platform? That would probably be because you weren't able to turn this off and now are listening or you are just a diehard. So either way, thank you.